It is an honor to be back in Birmingham at Temple Bethel for this year's Yom HaShoah commemoration. I just wish that I was there in person. Pardon me for one moment while I get ready to share my screen. Thank you to the Alabama Holocaust Education Center and to Temple Bethel for allowing me to share my family's story. First, I will answer a question. Yes, my parents were cousins, third cousins as a matter of fact. I always received a look from friends when I would introduce my maternal grandmother as Mrs. Nathan. This is the story of how my family survived the Nazis and wound up in Anniston, Alabama. Our story begins when Ferdinand and Isabella expelled the Jews from Spain in 1492. Some of those Jews fled west towards Italy, Greece, and Turkey. My family went north through Holland to Emmerich, Germany, our home for over 400 years and where we retained a lot of our Sephardic roots and rituals. Emmerich is in northwestern Germany. It is the last German port on the Rhine River before the river enters Holland. The first record of a Jewish community in Emmerich is from 1346. Pre-World War II, Emmerich was a town of about 15,000 persons and about 150 Jews. Because of early immigration, the 1930 census lists 112 Jews in Emmerich. By mid-1942, Emmerich was Judenrein, cleansed of its Jews, and it remains so today. About half of Emmerich's Jews were able to emigrate before World War II but 53 of Emmerich's Jews perished in the Holocaust. By the late 18th century, the German government and the German military for tax collection and conscription purposes needed a better way than Yaakov and Moshe or Jacob son of Moses to identify its Jewish citizens. In 1787, the Holy Roman Emperor Joseph II issued a decree which required Jews to adopt German or secular surnames. In 1808, Napoleon issued a similar document for Jews in the areas of Germany that France controlled, such as those in Emmerich. By 1845, the Prussian government had passed its own act requiring, and I quote, all Jews must carry firmly determined and inherited last names. Even though my family believed that Nathans had lived in Emmerich for over 400 years, the first Emmerich Nathan of whom we have a record is Benjamin Nathan, born in 1769. This slide is a photocopy of the Nathan name petition, which states that on July 20, 1846, in Dusseldorf, the Jew, Oster Benjamin, son of Benjamin Nathan from Emmerich, appeared before the police authority and was granted use of the name Nathan for himself and for his descendants. From Benjamin Nathan, we move forward three generations to my grandparents and their relatives. Please refer to the family tree in your program, which shows myself in yellow and my parents and my grandparents in gray. By the late 1800s, there were 43 Nathans in Emmerich and another 13 Nathans in nearby Elton, plus the families of the married female Nathans. My paternal grandfather, Felix, was one of 11 children. My maternal grandfather, George, was one of seven children. Both of my grandfathers fought for Germany in World War I and both were awarded Iron Crosses. I am proud of their service to their country. After World War I, <coughs> excuse me, life in Germany was not easy for anyone. 
economic inflation and the Treaty of Versailles reparation payments made it difficult for Germany, Germany's economy to recover. I remember my mother telling me that in the 1920s, a loaf of bread cost more than 1 million marks. Both of my grandfathers were cattle brokers or cattle dealers, a common occupation for German Jews. My paternal grandfather, Felix Nathan, or Opa, was well known in Emory, the head of the volunteer fire department, president of the Mardi Gras committee, and a member of the Schutzenverein, a private rifle club similar to our moose lodges. That club served as a place for men to gather without their wives and enjoy a drink. In 1933, the Schutzenverein honored Opa with their cross of merit and a parade honoring his 25 years of membership in the club. After Hitler came to power in 1933, life became difficult for Germany's Jews. You have heard many of those stories, so I won't repeat them. For both sides of my family, the decision of if, when, and how to leave Germany was very different. On my father's side, Oma's older brother, my great uncle, Lee Freibaum, had become a successful businessman in Gadsden, Alabama. Since the late 1920s, he had been encouraging Opa and his family to leave Germany for America, but Oma found it impossible to leave her homeland and her extended family. Being an optimist, Oma always thought things could not get any worse, but they did. By 1936, life had become so difficult for Jews that Opie decided to accept Uncle Lee's offer and send his two younger children, my Aunt Helen and my father Henry, to Anniston, Alabama. By then, Uncle Lee was an owner of a textile mill in Anniston, and he sponsored their immigration. In May 1937, Opie and Oma came to Anniston also sponsored by Uncle Lee. Opa and Oma's oldest daughter, Greta, and her husband, Rudy Kemp, delayed their exit from Emory. When they heard in late 1937 that the Nazis were coming to interrogate and possibly arrest them, they escaped to Holland and later made their way to France. In December 1937, they brought Oma's sister, Meta Freibaum, and her father, Solomon Freibaum, with them to Anniston. Again, all sponsored by Uncle Lee. Opa first worked in Uncle Lee's mill in Anniston. He later bought a general store, which he named Nathan's Lunch, and which became successful by running a lunch business for the nearby mill workers and by selling merchandise. On June 18, 1943, my father was drafted into the U.S. Army Air Force. During basic training in North Carolina, he received his naturalization papers. He spent the war in Yugoslavia and Italy as an Air Force firefighter. He was awarded three bronze stars for bravery in a combat zone and the Soldier's Medal for bravery outside of combat. Dad was discharged from the Army Air Force on December 7, 1945. Now we return to mid-1930s Emory and my mother and her family, noted in gray on this slide. The family included her father, George, or Schorsch, her mother, Taya Bendix Nathan, who we called Omi instead of Oma, and mom's younger sister, my Aunt Emmy. Schorsch was a very successful cattle dealer. He owned various pastures and a riverfront home where ice was delivered to their home every day and staff did the cooking and cleaning. In 1938, to further identify and degrade the Jews, the Nazis issued a decree that required the first name of any Jewish male or female to be preceded by the name Israel or Sarah. 
Jews still living in Germany at that time had their birth certificate annotated as shown here on my mother's birth certificate. In the late 1940s, Germany revoked that decree. My maternal grandfather, Schorsch, felt no rush to emigrate. He believed that his Iron Cross, his lifelong emirate friendships, and his business connections would protect him from the Nazis' anti-Jewish policies. Not so. In November 1938, after being arrested the day of Kristallnacht and then held prisoner for several days, Schorsch was ready to leave Germany, but it was too late. During the evening of Kristallnacht, Omian and Emmy were home, but were not harmed. Schorsch's house was ransacked and many precious items were destroyed. After Kristallnacht, Mom and Aunt Emmy were forced to leave public school. They went to work in Cologne and Frankfurt to train to be nannies and to learn how to sew. In November 1941, the Nazis ordered my mother's family and 12 other Emmerich Jews to report to the Emmerich train station on December 10th. Because of this notice, Mom and Aunt Emmy returned home. From the Emmerich train station, they were all transported by truck to Dusseldorf, where they spent the night in a former slaughterhouse. The next day on December 11, the same day that Germany declared war on the United States, the SS marched everyone to the Dusseldorf train station, where they boarded a train headed for the ghetto in Riga, Latvia. Before leaving Dusseldorf, their bags were confiscated and their jewelry was forcibly taken. The trains were overcrowded, and for four days, their only food was what they brought with them and eating snow whenever the train stopped. When the 1,007 Jews of the Dusseldorf transport arrived in Riga on December 14, SS soldiers forced them to walk for several hours in snow and ice from the Skirotava train station to the Riga ghetto. The Nazis offered transportation to older Jews, such as my grandparents. But my grandfather wanted to keep his family together, so he turned down their offer. Those who accepted rides from the Nazis were never seen again. Some weeks prior to my family arriving at the Riga ghetto, at least 25,000 Latvian Jews were taken from the ghetto to the nearby forests where they were shot and then buried in mass graves. The remaining 4,000 to 5,000 Latvian Jews were incarcerated in the small or Latvian ghetto. When my family arrived in the ghetto on December 14, the newly arriving German Jews were imprisoned in what became known as the big or German ghetto. There they found cooked food on the tables that had since frozen, clothes in the closets, and blood on the floors, all left from the evacuation and murder of the Latvian Jews. In the ghetto, my family, along with 12 other people, was assigned a small room with a kitchen. Everyone slept on the floor. At that time, my mother was 20 years old. 1942 was a very cold winter in Riga. Schorsch's foot became infected from hours of standing in the snow and ice during mandatory Nazi roll calls. There was no medicine to treat his infection, and on May 10, 1942, that infection killed him. We don't know what happened to his body. We have memorialized Schorsch in Yad Vashem and by inscribing his name on Omi's gravestone. Everyone in the ghetto had to work. Mom and Aunt Emmy worked outside the ghetto, cleaning the homes of German officers, shoveling snow and ice off the city streets, and cutting peat, a nasty job that resulted in staph infections. That peat was dried for fuel and was also used as a dressing to treat the wounds of Nazi soldiers. Everyone in the ghetto suffered from terrible cold, hunger, and overcrowding. 
Food rations were limited to two slices of stale bread per day and some watery soup at night. If they received meat, it was horse meat, which they ate to stay alive. Trying to keep kosher was a death sentence. In November 1943, the Riga ghetto was liquidated. By this time, Omi, Mom, and Aunt Emmy lived outside the ghetto near Arme Bekleidungsamt, the Army Clothing Office in the northern part of Riga, also known as ABA Bullgraben. It was one of five such facilities throughout the Riga area. While the ghetto was being liquidated, they remained at ABA where they sorted clothing from murdered Jews and dead soldiers and deloused that clothing with Zyklon B. Yes, as they later learned, this was the same deadly poison used to gas Jews in Auschwitz and elsewhere. Omi, Mom, and Aunt Emmy, along with their fellow prisoners, cleaned the clothing and readied that clothing for reuse by the military and by non-Jewish civilians. At great personal risk while at ABA, they were able to steal items of clothing, elastic bands from underwear, and elastic bands from eyeglass holders. Why? They could use the clothing and elastic bands to barter with the Latvians for food, even though the penalty for being caught with that food was death. By July 1944, the Soviet army was drawing near. The Nazis began systematically murdering and evacuating prisoners from all areas of Riga. Thousands of Jews who were sick or deemed unfit were murdered in a series of brutal actions. During those roundups, the SS wanted to take Omi away. A Nazi soldier who knew Omi convinced the SS to leave her alone because her daughters were good workers. On September 29, 1944, my family was transported by truck with about 200 other prisoners, 140 miles to Liebau, a city on the Latvian west coast. In Liebau, they stayed with the other prisoners in an apartment house and later in an old shoe factory. While in Liebau, they continued to work for the SS at the local ABA or clothing warehouse facility. Russian aircraft bombings were a regular occurrence in Liebau, and the prisoners were often forced to keep working during the bombings. When the bombings began on December 12, 19, excuse me, December 22, 1944, everyone ran to a nearby bunker. Omi had a bad cut on her leg, so her fellow prisoners offered her a seat closer to the entrance of the bunker. Instead, she chose to stay with her daughters and went to the rear of the bunker. That night, a bomb fell near the bunker entrance and killed 14 prisoners. But because they were at the rear of the bunker, Omi, Mom, and Aunt Emmy were okay. As the Russian army continued its westward advance, the Nazis moved their concentration camp prisoners into Germany. On February 19, 1945, after nine months at Liebau, or five months at Liebau, my family, along with the other Liebau prisoners, was transported in the bottom of a coal ship to Hamburg, Germany. They arrived on February 25 and were taken to Hamburg Fuhlsbüttel, an existing prison that is still in operation today. The men and the women were separated. A lot of the men were later shipped to Bergen-Belsen where most died. On April 12, 1945, the SS rounded up the Hamburg Fuhlsbüttel prisoners for a 60 mile death march from Hamburg to Kiel, Germany. Over a period of four days, about 800 malnourished prisoners improperly clothed and without decent footwear, marched in the cold weather on cobblestone roads from Hamburg to Erzionslager Nordmark in Kiel, knowing that if they stopped walking, the SS would shoot them. 
At one point during the death march, my mother wanted to quit. Omi told her that she had to continue because for three and a half years, they had survived too much and had come too far to stop now. Thankfully, mom continued on or I would not be here today. Conditions in Nordmark were very bad, the worst that they had encountered. Omi wrote in a 1947 letter that had they not been liberated after their two plus weeks in Nordmark, she did not think they would have survived. Food in Nordmark was non-existent. To have something to eat, they dug up raw beets and ate them. Bathing and personal hygiene were near impossible. Lice were prevalent. What was happening in, in the rest of Europe in the spring of 1945? The Russians continued to move westward and the American and British forces continued to push eastward. The Nazis, except for a few diehards, knew that Germany had lost the war and that the war would end shortly. It became a scramble for self-preservation. One of those self-preservation efforts was led by SS leader Heinrich Himmler. Towards the end of the war, he began to cut deals in exchange for money and the hope that he could lead a separate peace with the Allies. On April 20, 1945, Sweden's representative to the World Jewish Congress, a former German Jew named Norbert Major, was secretly flown from Stockholm to Berlin to meet with Himmler. As a result of this meeting and Himmler's subsequent negotiations, with the head of the Swedish Red Cross, Count Folk Bernadotte, a deal was struck to save several thousand Jews, including the Danish Jews at Nordmark. On April 30, 1945, the Nordmark prisoners were issued clean clothing in place of their prison, prison clothing and told to put it on. The next day on May 1st, 1945, 36 white buses with red crosses painted on the outside arrived at Nordmark. The Nordmark prisoners were gathered and told that they were now free and that they should board the buses. At first, most persons refused to board the buses. Too often they had witnessed Nazi ruses where those who boarded buses or trucks to nowhere never returned. Finally, the Danish volunteers and the Nazi soldiers convinced everyone to get aboard the buses. Thankfully, there was no effort to identify only Danish Jews. So my family and about 200 other German Jews were freed. The white buses traveled north to the Podborg Denmark train station where they boarded trains for the Danish East Coast and Copenhagen. In Copenhagen, the refugees boarded boats to Malmo, Sweden where they arrived on May 2nd, 1945, which also happened to be Log Bahomir. In Malmo, they were fed, deloused and quarantined and slept on clean white sheets for the first time since 1941. Over a period of several weeks, the refugees were moved to other displaced persons camps in Sweden. Whenever I heard a description of my family's time in Sweden, that description always included remarks about how well they were treated by the Swedes. Through all of the danger, cruelty, starvation, and turmoil from 1941 to 1945, Omi, Mom, and Aunt Emmy managed to say together, their strong will to live and the strength of a family were critical to their survival. Of the 16 Jews deported from Emory, to Riga in December 1941, only three survived, Omi, Mom, and Aunt Emmy. After release from quarantine, my family contacted Omi's sister, Paula Bendix Katzman, and her husband, Herman Katzman, who had moved to Stockholm before the war. They helped Mom and Aunt Emmy get jobs in Stockholm while Omi continued her recovery. In 1935, 
Germany stripped the Jews of their citizenship. Thankfully, the Swedes gave my family passports for persons without a nation. Those passports enabled them to travel with legal identification. When Omi, Mom, and Aunt Emmy received their American visas, they traveled to the U.S., arriving in New York on April 8, 1946, abo aboard the SS Drottning Hall. Relatives on the Nathan side of the family sponsored them, and relatives on the Bendix side of the family paid their way. Initially, Omi stayed with Nathan relatives in New York. Mom and Aunt Emmy stayed with Bendix relatives in Philadelphia, where they were told to get jobs, which they did. The Aufbau, an American-published German-language newspaper, was an important means of communication for the German-speaking American Jewish community. Beginning in September 1944, and each week thereafter, the Aufbau published names of, of Jews from around the world who had survived the concentration camps. The June 22, 1945 issue lists the names and a mailing address for 169 German Jewish survivors of the Riga concentration camp rescued from Nordmark to Sweden. In Anniston, Oma saw this article, saw Omi moms and Aunt Emmy's names and wrote to Omi in Sweden. Mom and dad had been sweethearts as young teenagers in Emory. They were separated when my father left for America in 1936. Omi told mom around July 4, 1946, that she had been corresponding with Oma. Mom wrote to dad, and that began a whirlwind romance. They met in New York City later in July and were engaged by the end of the weekend. Omi and mom visited, excuse me, visited Anniston in September 1946 and stayed with the Kemps. My parents were married on Sunday, November 3rd, 1946 at Temple Bethel in Anniston, Alabama. I was born in August, 1949, and my brother Mark arrived in May, 1952. Omi never remarried and lived with either mom or with Aunt Emmy until shortly before her death in Philadelphia in 1983 at age 91. When dad returned from the war, Oma and Opa offered their store Nathan's Lunch to him, but he wanted to be in business for himself. With several stops in between, dad bought a Chicken Delight franchise in 1959, and that summer we moved from Anniston to Homewood. In late 1967, dad closed the, re the restaurant and began a successful career as an industrial chemical salesman. He died in 1974 in Birmingham at age 53. After I was born, mom did not work outside our home. Instead, she did all the accounting for dad's businesses, raised my brother and me, and volunteered for the Temple Bethel Sisterhoods in Anniston and in Birmingham. After dad died, mom first worked part-time for Goldboro Jewelry. They required her to take a lie detector test, a pre-employment lie detector test. One question asked if she had ever stolen. She answered no and failed the test. When they interviewed her and asked about that question, she admitted that while in Riga, she stole food as a means of survival. After explaining her answer, she was hired. Later and for a number of years, mom worked for the Walter Nathan family at Penny Palmer in Homewood. She also volunteered as a pink lady at St. Vincent Hospital, and she delivered meals on wheels. Mom once said at about age 75, I deliver food to and give rides to old people. But the war had taken a toll on her health. For health reasons and to be near Mark and me, she moved to Atlanta in 1999. She died in Atlanta in 2002 at 80 years old. Today, 
I believe that a new Germany has emerged from the ruins of World War II. The Germans of my generation do not understand how their parents and grandparents became part of the war atrocities. They want to make sure that the Holocaust is not forgotten. Thus, commemorations like the Stolpersteine Project, the literal translation is stumbling stones. On this slide, you see the Stolpersteine for my father's family. They were placed at the location of their former Emmerich home. On this next slide, you see the Stolpersteine for my mother's family, also located in front of their former Emirate residence. The Stolpersteine used the German word ermordert for persons like Schorsch who died in the camps. The first time I saw that wording, I was taken aback by its directness. The translation means murdered. To me, that is one acknowledgement of the atrocities that occurred. In Germany, our children's generation cannot fathom how a society degraded to the point that it allowed the mass killings of groups of people. We must continue to counter Holocaust deniers and other misinformed persons. We must continue to never forget. Thank you for this opportunity to share Sophie and Henry Nathan's story with you.